and we'll be able to sing an endless hallelujah to the King. And so my heart this morning in the middle of pain, this is the first time our family has had something this close. Uh, Sang a song, it's been several years ago, it was one that I heard when I was driving down the road and I was so impacted by the message that I had to pull over. I don't know if you've ever heard a song like that before, but I thought, I can't even drive, I'm so overwhelmed. And so I pulled over and this is the song. I thought of it on Wednesday when we got the news here in town. Um, it's been on my heart all week and this morning. It, it wouldn't go away. So I texted Kyle and said I would be home to sing it. So now you know. Um, and we're thrilled to have Clay and Brianna here, dear friends of ours. Um, we go back to King Hill Baptist Church at days. And um, I'm glad you're here. And I know you'll be faithful to share the word this morning. And so that's good. I think that's all I need to say. I'm going to sing now.
through this song, through your scriptures, Lord, through our lives. We see this as uh, the opposition to frustration and anger that we see in the lives of others. Lord, we have unity in the Holy Spirit in Christ. We pray this morning for the Dixon family, for Greg and his family as they uh, do what needs to be done. Um, they have already, Lord, praised you and worshiped you and given you honor because of your sovereignty. We thank you, Lord, that you are that way and for all of us. Um, allow us to continue to praise you, to worship you, to share scripture, and allow you to speak to us this morning. We pray this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Robert, would you come and share scripture this morning? <coughs> great reward. Psalm 19, 9 through 11. Our call to worship this morning is found in Psalm chapter 33, verses 1 through 12. Or actually verses 11 and 12, I'm sorry. And it says, um, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people of whom he has chosen, as his heritage. Psalm 33, 11 and 12. Would you stand together? Stand together and continue to praise. One of the phrases we've already said this morning is to God be the glory. So we're going to sing that this morning. I told someone this morning, or this week, uh, whatever your thoughts on protests and everything, we know there are things that we stand for for the Lord. And we're protesting sin, we're protesting and resisting the devil. And so that's what we are praising this morning about. So stand together and Sue, actually, what are you doing? Let's try this off, right? Yes. All right, to God be the Lord. Thank you. 
praise the Lord as we share that. Lord God, we come before you this time, remembering the scriptures you give us that say we confess our sins, you are faithful, and you are just to forgive us of our sin, cleanse us, Lord, of all unrighteousness. And we've learned that 
faith is hearing your promises and believing them because you are faithful to keep them. And we thank you for that. But we can be assured right now that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. We thank you for that relationship, Lord. Uh, if you lift up in prayer, uh, those that are on my prayer card, as those in this room, I'm sure have similar ways of remembering those that they want to uh, bring to you, Lord. In your sovereignty, I just ask that you would draw people to yourself who will also experience your salvation, pardon from sin, Lord. Please continue to lead us and guide us as we study your word, as we hear its promises, as we believe them, and as we live that way. Thank you for your salvation. We praise you. We love you. Amen. Um, Pastor Greg had shared a, prepared a uh, scripture to share this time. So this is Hosea 6, 1 through 3. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. Amen. Um, Robert, if you would come and share uh, Old Testament and New Testament scriptures today. Sarah's womb. 
No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us and believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Would you stand together as we continue to sing it? <coughs>
we will be looking at that um, this morning. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, I thank you for everything you do for us. I thank you for um, the fact that we have uh, just the ability to come together today. I thank you that um, that you are in control. You're in control in, in the midst of uh, suffering, you're in control in the midst of rejoicing, you're in control in the midst of pandemics, and in the midst of civil unrest. God, I, I just ask that um, as we turn to your word, that uh, you would um, get me out of the way, that, that these words would not be uh, my words, but they would be words that, that uh, are from you. They would be, um, that you would just use me today, God. You know that I have uh, no authority to, to speak on this subject. So I stand behind the word. I stand behind um, your word that you've given to us. And I just pray that uh, that the Holy Spirit work a miracle this morning and that we uh, are able to retain the truth that is only possible through a miracle. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, today we will be taking a look at the fourth chapter of Daniel. If you have your Bibles or a Bible in front of you in the pew, I ask you to take it out as we will be frequently referencing the book of Daniel this morning. But before that, to um, understand a little bit of the circumstance of Daniel, you have to know a little bit about the story of Israel's history. Israel was the chosen people of God, ordained to bring about the eventual salvation of the world through Jesus. This nation was expected to follow the one true God, fulfill his commands, and love him above all else. But they fell from this. They turned from God and demanded that they have a king to be like all the other nations, and they got their wish. The kings they had ended up leading the nation, nation into deeper sin. So Israel went through times of terrible kings that led them through all sorts of idolatry and sin pridefully rejecting God. In this time, we have the prophets, people who were messengers of God. The messengers were sent by God to urge the people to repent, for judgment was imminent. And when Israel refused to listen, God again sent prophets, but this time to tell them that their judgment was imminent, regardless of their repentance. And that's when it happens. During one of these particular times of, uh, of severe rebellion against God, a great judgment falls. A man from an eastern land attacks. The year is 605 AD. Excuse me, 605 BC. The nation he leads is Babylon. His name, King Nebuchadnezzar. Israel is led away over the course of three separate attacks, the final being in the year 5086 AD, BC. Israel is stripped of their homeland, their temple, their cities, their way of life. Imagine for a moment what would happen if America was under a great invasion and you were forced to pack what little you could carry, gather your family, and you were commanded to depart to a faraway land, to a city you did not know, to live with a people that you did not know. It would be heart Now imagine, in addition to all of this, you were God's chosen people. You had a pride about this, a knowledge that God had chosen, appointed your ancestors to bring about salvation of the whole world. You were now being led away, taken by a nation that supposedly hated the things of God, had no knowledge of the things of God. 
This, brothers and sisters, is the judgment of Israel, the exile into Babylon. And this is what this book is written about, Daniel's prophetic visions and life events. He writes this book to record these events late in life, perhaps most likely when he's in his 80s. And the purpose of this book is this, to encourage Israel, to encourage followers of God, to encourage the church today, to help the people of God of all time understand this fundamental truth, that God is in control, that God is the sovereign ruler over people. He dispenses power where he wishes. He does what he wants and can cause people to do what he wants. God is in charge. He is in control. He is totally, unmistakably, completely sovereign. So to bring you up to speed in what has happened in the book so far, Daniel opens up with these words in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 of the book of Daniel. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and lay siege to it. The Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him. Notice the wording there. Notice the wording in this passage. If this were a normal story, you may hear in verse 2 that Jeho Jehoiakim was conquered. Or maybe you would hear that Nebuchadnezzar was successful in overthrowing Jerusalem and the land of Judah. But in reality, it reads, the Lord handed. This is not something that was unforeseen by God. He knew it would happen and caused it to happen for the judgment of a sinful people. The first two verses set the theme of God's sovereignty. Israel had been handed over for punishment. And so the, the, the nation of Israel has been taken by Babylon. The royal family is taken, and Daniel, being a part of the royal family, is taken, along with his friends. Daniel is taken into captivity when he was 15, and he is brought in and trained to be a servant, close to the king. And in the process, he and his friends are given new names. And he is given the name Belteshazzar, after the name of one of the gods of Babylon, Bel, and meaning Bel protecting. But as we see, Daniel remains faithful. Despite he has a new name, despite he has a new place to live, despite he has a new job, he remains faithful through his training. He is given food to eat that is unclean, food that has been strictly condemned by the Old Testament. Food that has been offered to idols, something that would be unthinkable for a follower of God's eat, and he faithfully refuses to give in and is blessed physically because of it. Time passes and Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that no man can interpret. He ends up calling upon Daniel and his friends and demands an interpretation without telling Daniel what the dream was about, either to test his validity, to test the validity of the interpretation, or... Um, he may have just forgotten what it, what it was, but he knew it was important. So Daniel and his friends not only go on to explain the dream that the king had, but also to interpret the dream. If you follow along in chapter 2, verse 47, you see Nebuchadnezzar's reaction to the successful interpretation. Chapter 2, verse 47, the king said to Daniel, Your God is the God of gods, and Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, since you were able to reveal this mystery. As a result of all this, Nebuchadnezzar elevates Daniel and his three friends to positions of power in Babylon, and he professes that God is God over all. But sadly, and as we will see, this is not a profession that will last for long. So I want you to know this is the first time this profession has been made. But we go on. So in another story that I'm sure you all have heard, Nebuchadnezzar builds a statue. It is a statue made of gold in his likeness and stands 90 feet tall. He commands everyone in the whole land to bow down to it. Daniel's three friends refuse to do so, saying that God is the only God to whom they will bow. Nebuchadnezzar, filled with pride and extremely angry at their defiance, rises up and has them thrown into an incredibly hot flame. In the flame, however, God protects them. Amazed at this obvious miracle of them emerging from the flame unscathed, he makes this statement again in chapter 3, verse 28. 
chapter 3, verse 20 to 8, Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel and rescued his servants who trusted in him. They violated the king's command and risked their life rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I issue a decree that anyone of any people, nation, or language who says anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be torn limb from limb, and his house made of garbage dung. For there is no other God who is able to deliver like this. But in this instant again, he makes a profession of the one true God a second time. He not only praises him, but he commands this time that others do the same. But as we know, a simple profession of faith in God is not, does not necessarily save a person. But only that saving, lasting, changing faith that causes a person to be a follower that submits to Jesus as Lord and casts aside his own pride and abilities. That is what causes a person to become a child of the one true God and to love his law. So this is the second time that Nebuchadnezzar makes a profession. And throughout the first three chapters of Daniel, we see that Nebuchadnezzar has had multiple opportunities to glorify God. That God has clearly revealed himself. Nebuchadnezzar is now without the excuse of not knowing who God is. He has seen miracles through dreams, through the man Daniel, through attempting to barbecue Daniel and his friends. And he has professed his sovereignty at least two times, twice by this time. But he is about to get a very... Real wake up call. And that leads us to chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. Years have passed. Daniel is now in his 40s. And he has been in Nebuchadnezzar's service for quite some time, for a majority of his life at this point. And Nebuchadnezzar is late in his reign. He is aged. We see in chapter 4. But something big has happened to Nebuchadnezzar, and he has a need to announce it. And this, chapter 4, this is Nebuchadnezzar's announcement to the world. We'll see that this is what Nebuchadnezzar has gone out to proclaim to the world. This recorded here in Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4, starting off with verses 1 through 3. King Nebuchadnezzar, that's the, the author of this address, to those of every people, nation, and language who live on the whole earth, to those he is addressing. May your prosperity increase. I am pleased to tell you about the miracles and wonders the Most High God has done for me. How great are his miracles, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar has clearly had an event that has changed his life. His message is that of praise to God and even includes a little song verse about how he is great. His kingdom is forever. His dominion lasts from generation to generation. Usually a king lasts a generation. A dynasty may last several generations, but God's kingdom is eternal. Right. Further, Nebuchadnezzar has an urge to proclaim this to the nations. Notice that he addresses every people, nation, and language. He wants to get this message out. Talking about, talk about an evangelist. <laughs> but moving on to the message itself, let's continue reading. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my palace and flourishing in my palace. I had a dream and it frightened me. While in my bed, the images and visions in my mind alarmed me. So I issued a decree to bring all the wise men of Babylon to me in order that they might make the dream's interpretation known to me. When the magicians, mediums, Chaldeans, and diviners came in, I told them the dream, but they could not make its interpretation known to me. Finally, Daniel named Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy God is in him, came before me, and I told him the dream. Belteshazzar, head of the magicians, because I know that you have the spirit of the holy gods, and no mystery puzzles you. Explain to me the visions of my dream that I saw and its interpretation. 
In the visions of my mind, I was lying in bed, and I saw this. There was a tree in the middle of the earth, and it was very tall. The tree grew large and strong, its top reached to the sky, and it was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, and its fruit was abundant, and on it was food for all. Wild animals found shelter under it. The birds of the sky lived in its branches, and every creature fed from it. As I was lying in my bed, I also saw visions in my mind of a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven. He called out loudly, cut down the tree and chop off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump and its roots in the ground, with a band of iron and bronze around it in the tender grass of the field. Let him be drenched with dew from the sky and share the plants of the earth with the, with the animals. Let his mind be changed from that of a human and let him be given the mind of an animal for seven periods of time. This word is by decree of the watchers, and the decision is by command from the Holy One, so that the most that the living will know that the Most High is ruler over human kingdoms. He gives to them anyone he wants and set the, sets the lowliest of people over them. This is the dream that I and Nebuchadnezzar had. Now Belteshazzar, tell me the interpretation. Because none of the wise men in my kingdom can make the interpretation known to me. But you can, because you have the spirit of the holy gods. So we see here in this passage, Nebuchadnezzar was enjoying his palace. He was enjoying all his great wealth. At this point, he was the first of the great world leaders of Western civilization. He had a great deal of wealth and abundance of blessings. He was in his palace and had a dream. The dream that occurred to him frightened him. He called once again on all the wise men to come and make the dream known to him. But again, he saw from the earlier dream in the book of Daniel, no one was able to interpret the dream for him. We see the word finally used in verse 8. Finally, he calls upon Daniel. Finally, he makes the decision to do so. And I want to note this. How often is it that we feel like God is a last resort? We feel that God's way of doing something is our final way, our final end. Nebuchadnezzar allows time to pass before he calls upon Daniel. So often we do the exact same thing. We wait to try to figure something out on our own, only until we exhausted all of our efforts do we call upon someone for help. What needlessly we toil, wasting time trying to go out our own way. If only we would call upon God to help us. And Nebuchadnezzar exhausted his efforts. Nebuchadnezzar calls upon Daniel for help. And Daniel comes to the aid of Nebuchadnezzar. And as the dream explained to him, Daniel patiently listens as he hears of a beautiful tree giving provision to all and seen by all. The tree is cut and the tree's influence is gone. And all that is left is a stump with its roots remaining. And then the dream gets a little more bizarre. We see that the stump will be in a field and will be drenched with dew and will share, meaning eat, plants with animals. The mind of the stump will be changed from that of a human, and it should be obvious at this point that we are no longer talking about a stump, but we're talking about a human. And will be given the mind of an animal. All of this will happen for seven periods of time. And we know from this language that is used elsewhere in Daniel that this word, period of time, is to mean um, seven years. The stump will lose its mind for seven years. And all of this is done for a purpose. As we see here in verse 17, that the purpose of this dream was to inform all that God is ruler over all kingdoms. Notice how it doesn't say Nebuchadnezzar or Daniel or the exiles in Babylon or the nation of Babylon exclusively. It says the living. All living. The same inclusive nature of the address we see at the beginning of this proclamation is what we see here now. All living will know that the Most High is ruler over human kingdoms. And he has power over them. So Nebuchadnezzar puts it all on the table for Daniel to interpret. He lays it all down. And no one is able to tell what it means, and he's feeling hopeless. He desires to know. He waits for Daniel's response. And we see Daniel's response continuing on in verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was stunned for a moment, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king said, Belteshazzar, don't let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, my lord, 
May the dream apply to those who hate you and its interpretation to your enemies. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, whose top reached the sky was vis visible to the whole earth, and whose leaves and beautif were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals lived, and in its branches, the birds of the sky lived. That tree, your majesty, is you. For you have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown even to the reaches of the sky, and your dominion extends to the ends of the earth. The king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven, saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave its thumb with the roots in the ground, and a band of iron and bronze around it, in the tender grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew from the sky, and share food with the wild animals for seven periods of time. This is the interpretation, your majesty, and this is the decree of the Most High that has been issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from the people to live with the wild animals. You will feed on grass like cattle, and will be drenched with dew from the sky for seven periods of time until you acknowledge that the Most High is ruler over human kingdoms, and he gives to them anyone he wants. As for the command to leave the tree stump with its roots, your kingdom will be restored. Its roots to you have you have as you acknowledge that heaven rules. I'm going to read that verse again. As for the command to leave the tree stump with its roots, your kingdom will be restored to you as you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, may my advice seem good to you, my king. May my advice seem good to you, my king. Separate yourself from your sins by doing what is right, and from your injustices by showing mercy to the needy. Perhaps there will be an extension of your prosperity. So Daniel is stunned. Initially, he is stunned. He is a loyal servant to the king. He has been in his service for around 35 years of this time. And he hears the dream and immediately knows from God, it has been revealed what is going to happen to his king. He may be fearful for what the king's response will be, or he may just be genuinely fearful for a man he has grown so close to working with over time. But whatever the cause may be, he cannot speak. He is so greatly alarmed. Nebuchadnezzar reassures him, and then Daniel begins to speak. He begins this dreaded interpretation by saying, first and foremost, my Lord, may the dream apply to those who hate you and its, certain, and its interpretation to your enemies. See, he doesn't want the things that are, he knows will happen to happen. The interpretation that Daniel gives is an explanation against Nebuchadnezzar, and that he will be driven away from people for seven years, that he will live with wild animals, and that his mind will be taken away. And, his, and as a result... His power, his fame, his glory, his money, his fortunes, everything will be stripped from him. He will live with wild animals. He will live with wild animals for seven years and die with wild animals for seven years. Daniel also addresses the fact that the stuff with its roots will remain. This signifies that the kingdom has not been forgotten during these seven years. And as soon as Nebuchadnezzar swallows his pride, admits that heaven rules, he will be restored to his kingdom. When Nebuchadnezzar admits that God is ruler, he will restore, be restored to his kingdom. Following this, Daniel then makes a remarkable attempt to get the king to repent of his sins. For if he would repent of pride, perhaps he would be spared. Perhaps there would be an extension of Nebuchadnezzar's prosperity. But we see what happens based on Nebuchadnezzar's track record. We see what happens continuing on in verse 28. All of this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, as he was walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon, the king exclaimed, Is this not Babylon the Great? that I have built to be a royal residence by my vast power and for my majestic glory. 
And while the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared that the kingdom has departed from you. You will be driven away from people to live on the wild animals, live with the wild animals. You will feed on grass like cattle for seven periods of time until you acknowledge that the Most High is ruler over human kingdoms, and he gives to them anyone he wants. At that moment, at that moment, the message against Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from the people. He ate grass like cattle, and his body was drenched with dew from the sky until his hair grew like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. So this here we see is a terribly unpleasant picture of what happens to the character we have been following. He is given 12 months, 12 months to repent, 12 months to confess his pride, 12 months to denounce his wickedness, 12 months to confess to idolatry, 12 months to get his pride under control. It is definitely true when we read what the psalmist says. In Psalm 103, verse 8, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in faithful love. But in his perfect timing, judgment comes. This is apparent to Israel, and it will soon be apparent to the king. God is rich in love. He is slow to anger. But this does not mean that God does not get angry. This does not mean that perfect, righteous judgment will not fall. Nebuchadnezzar is about to find this out. He is out about walking in his palace. He goes up to the roof one day. He has done a lot for this city, after all. He admires, perhaps, the great king gardens, which would become one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, or one of his other great palaces from afar, all of which have been built by his work. He admires the beautiful city that has been built up in the middle of a vast, harsh desert, this flourishing city. He has taken it its beauty. And he says, is this not Babylon the great that I have built to be my royal residence, to be my vast power, for my majestic glory? Does this man not remember the words that he had spoken about the great God of the universe years before? Has he really become so consumed by himself that he has forgotten the fiery flame of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. While he was speaking, in the instant that he spoke, the words rang down from heaven that he knew of well in advance. It is declared that the kingdom has departed from him. Note that the judgment falls on him while the words are still in his mouth. God has waited until the, the point. God has waited until the point where his sin is at its fullest. His pride was at its peak when judgment falls. So there's a study on, well, a, a medical mental illness called boanthropy. Boanthropy. The sufferer effectively thinks of himself as a cow and proceeds to do all the things that a cow does walk on all fours, eat grass in the field, lose track of reality, become unable to speak. We would live with wild animals, and it would not surprise me in the least that Nebuchadnezzar was a sufferer of this mental illness. He loses his mind. He begins to eat grass like cattle. He lives among wild animals. It would not take man for a man like this to be stripped of his rule and driven from evil. A horrifying sight, indeed, for one such a prominent ruler. But that's not the end, of course. Continuing on in verse 34. But at the end of those days, at the end of those seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven, and my sanity returned to me. Then I praised the Most High and honored, honored and glorified him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing. And he does what he wants with the armies of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. There is no one who can block his hand or say to him, What have you done? 
At this time, my sanity returned to me, and my majesty and splendor returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and my nobles sought me out, and I was reestablished over my kingdom, and even more greatness came to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and glorify the King of Heavens, because all his works are true, and his ways are just. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. A beautiful story of restoration. Nebuchadnezzar looks to the sky. Notice that his sanity is not yet restored to him at this time, but he simply looks. Seven years of insanity, and a look toward heaven, an acknowledgement. Instantly, restoration returns to him, then praise comes. Praise that is no longer directed at himself, but at the Most High God. His words include echoes of the introduction of this long proclamation, words of God's glory, his dominion being everlasting, his kingdom being lasting from generation to generation. He does what he wants, and no one can say anything of it. He is fully restored in this moment. No longer does he live with wild animals. No longer does he eat grass of the field. No longer is he out of his mind, but he is returned to his royal position. He is restored to his kingdom, no longer full of pride, but in service to the one who has given him his power. No longer boastful about his accomplishments, but in submission to the King of Heaven, the one ruler over all men, who has authority to give and take away. Nebuchadnezzar has learned his lesson. Of course, we don't know the heart, but it is quite indeed possible that Nebuchadnezzar, at this moment, had saving faith in God. So what can we learn from this story, from this proclamation? of a man intending to communicate this to generations over time and over the whole world. We can learn some very key things about the sin of pride. We learn that a prideful heart can be absolutely devastating to an individual. So let us look at the sin of pride in regard to Daniel chapter 4. Pride, the act of thinking of ourselves as more highly than we ought. The act of putting ourselves in the place of God has devastating effects on our lives and causes a variety of problems. Today, if you're taking notes, I present to you four truths on pride. The first one is this. Pride leads to a variety of sins. It is true that pride in and of itself is a sin. When we allow ourselves to be filled with pride, we end up elevating ourselves above God. And this is one of the problems that we see that Nebuchadnezzar had. He had a blatant disregard for God's gift. And as you remember, in the words of verse 29, Is this not Babylon the Great that I have built to be my for the powers, by my vast power, and for my majestic glory. In this statement, he totally disregards God and counts himself as higher and as worthy of worship. If we worship anything other than God, including ourselves, we call that idol worship. The sin of pride has a tendency to lead us to worship ourselves and desire for others to worship us. Pride leads us into idol worship, idol worship and causes us to be covetous, of worship, but it also leads us into a place of unachievable expectation on ourselves. These high expectations cause us to lean on our own power to fulfill them. We, when full of pride, believe that we are higher than God, and being higher than God, after all, we should be able to fulfill all of our expectations. It puts great strain on us and puts tremendous strain on our families and those very close to as well. When they see our expectations, we set and desperately try to fulfill them. And of course, they cannot fulfill them. And when, we, when they can't or when we think we must fulfill them, when they come up short, that leads us into something we call worry, anxiety. The pride, the sin of pride, leads us into the sin of worry. And yes, worry, fear of what could be, is a sin. I heard on the radio some time back that 92% of our words never have a chance at becoming a reality. And when we think about what a mighty God we serve, our worries, our anxieties, our fears, all seem the more ridiculous. Especially when we look at these verses through Scripture. 1 Peter 3.14 
Do not be fear, do not fear or be intimidated. Philippians 4, verse 6, do not worry about anything but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving and present your request to God. Joshua 1, 9, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Luke 12, 22, do not worry about your life. John 14, 27, do not let your heart be troubled or fearful. When God continually gives a command to his people, saying, do not worry, do not be afraid. And when God's people break that command, we have a word. That word is sin. If we struggle with anxieties, when we struggle with fears, pride is only throwing fuel on that fire. If we have problems with fear, we do nothing to have our pride. We are simply trying to put out a flame with gasoline. Our pride causes us not to see that our Creator, our Sustainer, is there, willing to take up our worries and handle them Himself. And it causes us to be anxious, expecting to be able to take care of ourselves. Pride also has a tendency to lead us into perfectionism, the thought that we have to be totally perfect in every sense to be our own sustainer. The thought that we must be totally perfect, excuse me, pride can cause us to covet as it did with Cain. Pride can cause us to hate. Pride can cause us to think that we were above sin. It can cause us to let our guard down to any sin. Brothers and sisters, pride will consume your life if we do not keep it in check. Pride not only leads us into a variety of sins, but number two, pride will blind you to God's warnings. Look at the example of our good king here. He had multiple reasons to know that God condemned pride, to know that God was above all. He even confessed it several times before this. He had a warning for a dream that if, there were, if, if he were to be haughty, God would strip him of his kingdom. And he was given a year to repent, but he did not repent. He was blind to his own sin. He was blind, blind to his pride. When we are blind to our sin, we have a serious problem, especially if our sin causes us to be blind to that sin. We must then rely on the Holy Spirit to seek to walk in humility and listen to the rebuke of people who are close to us to identify pride in our lives. Daniel himself was one such rebuker. He, caring about the king, attempted to make his own pride attempted to make Nebuchadnezzar pride known to Nebuchadnezzar, and if we ignore those who lovingly attempt to help us, we do ourselves no service. So, pride will lead you into a variety of sins, number one. Pride will blind you to, to God's warnings, but number three, um, pride shifts uh, our focus from God to ourselves. When we begin to think of ourselves as higher than God, it will most certainly lead to our demise. We look at the example of Paul's review to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Who makes you so superior? What do you have that you did not receive? If, in fact, you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Apparently, the Corinthians thought they were something else. They thought that they had something that they had created, and the fact that they had been given something had been lost on them. How often do we do? We look at our lives, our houses, our cars, and think, I earned this. I worked for this. I made this by my own ability. Well, yes, you did. But, but the question I ask is, is who gave you that ability in the first place? And who can take that ability that you had to create all of that, mm -hmm. to do all of that for you? Who can take that and turn it into the ability of acting like a cow. When we get caught up in this trivial matter of pride, it shifts our focus from what it should be on, which is God, to the things that God gives us. When fighting pride, we must remain humble and know that as, as Job says in Job chapter uh, 1, verse 21, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Finally, and for a fourth point here, we see one more problem that pride creates for us. Pride will lead us to destruction. Pride led Nebuchadnezzar to his destruction in the moment that pride was fully manifested. And the minute that our pride is fully manifested, it can do the same for us. I know there are times in your life when this has been the case. 
when this is happening to you, your pride has caused you to immediately be humble in some way or another. Perhaps the instances are humorous. Perhaps um, others are embarrassing. And perhaps others still have left a permanent and painful mark on your life. Friends, because of the destructive nature that pride has in our lives, God will not allow you to stay in it. He will humble you. Because pride is destructive. Pride is a major issue that causes us to be resistant to God. When Jesus died on the cross for our sin, he established an opportunity for us to come back into his fold. We are told over and over again throughout scripture that we are saved by grace through faith alone. And yet, what do we do? What do false religions do? They have a tendency to attribute their own works to their salvation. And we try to take part in our own sal salvation. We, we let pride consume us. When we let pride consume us, we have a tendency to convince ourselves that we have an ability to work out our own salvation. That we have an ability to contribute to our own salvation. That we are saved. Pride, pride has a tendency to, to tell us that we are saved um, by grace through faith plus works. When it's by grace through faith plus nothing. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one, no one can boast. Your good works, my friends, cannot save you. Christian, your works are not keeping you safe. They are not yours anyway. They come from abiding in Christ, as John 15 tells us. Boast not in your own ability. Lead to your destruction, but place your faith in Jesus. Faith that is genuine faith that leads to repentance and not and only point any glory to Christ for any work that you can meagerly accomplish. Finally, my friends, pride is a struggle that we are going to battle through the help of Christ. Through his work on the cross and his ability, we must crush every bit of pride in our lives. When fighting pride, we must remember the theme of man. When fighting pride, you must remember the theme of Daniel. That theme is this, God is sovereign over all. That's right. Mm -hmm. When you battle pride, remember that God is in control. If you do not battle pride, well, um, go on the fact that God is in control, and you are not, perhaps it will expose your pride if it is blind to you, or it will prevent pride from welling up in your life. But do not do this begrudgingly. Rejoice in the fact. Rejoice in the fact that you are not in control. Dwell on the fact that God is. Make a mental habit when anxiety, pride, sin arrives, arises in your life. Reflect on the story of Daniel and know that God is sovereign over all. He is sovereign over kings, over rulers, over evil, over Satan, over death, over your own salvation, over your good works and abilities, over your sanity, over your insanity, over your life, over the lives around you, over your shortcomings, over your sicknesses and illnesses. God is sovereign when there are times of civil unrest. God is sovereign in the midst of a pandemic. God is sovereign in the midst of tragedy. Mm -hmm. God is sovereign over all. And praise God right. that we are servants of a sovereign king. Amen. The only true and wise king. How often do we um, forget this truth? That there is nothing that takes God by surprise. I'm guilty of it. But God is in control. Amen. Amen. sovereign over all, we reject our pride. And friends, I urge you, um, do not do as Nebuchadnezzar did, and lift your eyes to heaven. Um, and, and lift your eyes to yourself, but do, do what he eventually did, and lift your eyes to heaven. Acknowledge that heaven rules, rest in his grace. And that really is the answer. God is in
Black Mach 4 Men's Ministry. And so that's going to be at Hopewell next Saturday. Six o'clock. Thank you. So if you've been a part of that or would like to be a part of that, basically a group of men in our community come together. There's usually a time of devotion, a time where we try to um, establish any needs that our community has, and then a time where we try to meet those needs. It was pretty simple. Guys like to keep it simple, right? <laughs> All right. So if you'd like to be a part of that, Hope Club Baptist Church at 6 o'clock on Saturday. And is there anything else that I need to make sure we announce? Well, let's, uh, let's actually stand together. Well, I'd like to close us in prayer. And thank you all so much for being here. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, you are deserving of endless hallelujahs as we begin our service in your mind. You are holy. You are sovereign. There is no way we could stand here all day and try to explain you. You are God. I just pray, Lord, that our lives would reflect even the smallest bit of understanding of that truth. We pray for your strength, for your guidance. We pray that we would remember uh, our position as uh, having you as our Father. We thank you, Lord. Allow us not to be confused or lied to in a way that will draw us away from you. Uh, we pray your Holy Spirit would lead and uh, remind us of the truth and teach us. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We uh, pray you would bless uh, Clay and his family as well as he continues to uh, not only work but minister in this way we call upon him. We thank you for his willingness. Praise you, Lord. We love you. Amen.